just like to share with you as I do before every class how the translation is going. I am almost finished with Galatians. Uh, I have found that translating the Apostle Paul is a really difficult uh, undertaking. He, he writes the densest prose that I know of. And now that's my own term. Uh, it means ideas per sentence. Uh, he does not waste words. Uh, and that means he packs a tremendous amount of information uh, in every sentence. Does he do that throughout his letters? Yes. Uh, and uh, one of the difficulties always is that what uh, the uh, people that wrote the book How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth call hi historical uh, distance. Uh, because he assumes a socio-economic historical setting uh, in the first century uh, Mediterranean world. That's probably part of the shorthand. Yes, it is. It, 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 and uh, that's one reason that the discussion among scholars is so important talking about what really is the background for the New Testament. Uh, I accept what's called the new perspective on Paul. Uh, and uh, N.T. Wright is one of its uh, most powerful advocates. And that is that what is called in the scholarly world uh, the second, second temple Judaism is the background. Uh, the people, the Jewish people at the time of Christ uh, were in a crisis, a crisis of faith because uh, it had been nearly 400 years since God had spoken in his written revelation. And uh, I didn't know this until fairly recently when I began to read, well, I read uh, uh, Jesse Sanders' book, J.P. Sanders' book in 1978, just a year after it came out. He's the one that started it. And they were uh, really longing for the day of the Lord. Uh, they realized that the promises made about a return from captivity had not been completely fulfilled. And, and that that's based on the fact that there were more Jews living outside of Palestine than there were living inside. There was probably three million Jews in the present day country of Israel. A little bit mo more than that. Included all the West Bank and uh, uh, the Decapolis cities uh, across the Jordan. And it, so that they knew that these promises had not been totally fulfilled. And what happened is that the fulfillment of the return was accomplished by the life, work, death, resurrection, and ascension of the Messiah, Jesus. And that's what Paul was aware of. And every one of his letters, he assumes that that's true, that the, that the promises of return were not a physical return of all Jews to that promised land, 
but a return of God to leading his people, i.e. the kingdom of God. And we know that you, this class knows because we've emphasized it, that you have that yet and not yet fulfillment of that. So in a real sense, the promise of return is in the process of being fulfilled in and through us who are believers today. And that it will be completed not by the return of the Jews physically to a piece of land in the eastern Mediterranean, but by a new heaven and a new earth, which was the vision with which Isaiah closed his uh, book of prophecy, that there would come a time when the old creation would pass away and, and there would be a new heaven and a new earth in which the curse that followed the uh, sin of Adam and Eve would be done away with completely and that the, the new creation would be complete what God had in mind for the creation before Adam and Eve sinned. Uh, in other words, the first Adam sinned, the second Adam prepared the way for God to, to be faithful. Uh, where God is t much, many times in Paul, where you have the phrase, the righteousness of God, that could be translated, and I do translate it in my translation, the faithfulness of God. God made a covenant with Abraham that had two points. One, that all the nations of the world would be blessed through the, and we usually say the seed of Abraham. Uh, the word seed, translated seed in the Old Testament, can also mean family. And Paul uses the word uh, in the family sense. And so in the family, the descendants of Abraham, specifically in the person of, of the Christ, Jesus, uh, they, this prophecy or promise made to Abraham. But also, there is the promise that he would have many offspring or descendants. A large family would be a good translation of the idea. And so, there is where Paul takes his stand. And if you believe in Christ, you are a part of the family, the seed, the descendants of Abraham, and the covenant promises made to Abraham are fulfilled in, through, and by believers today. That's the reason that Paul is so adamant to say that both Jew and Gentile are saved alike, and that their salvation is based upon the promises made to Abraham. And that's the reason we need to think of ourselves as descendants of Abraham. I have as much right to claim descent from Abraham, according to the teachings of the Apostle Paul, as anybody who is physically, biologically descended. Now, notice, I don't I'm not superior to them, which many uh, Christians believe and has been the, been the cause of much anti-Semitism in the past. But I am equal to them in the receipt and being blessed by the promises made to Abraham. 
And that's what Paul is getting at. Uh, in nearly every one of his letters, that comes out. That is what motivated his idea that you need to break down the wall of partition between Jew and Gentile and have, as he says in Ephesians, one new person uh, where everybody is equal. Now, that's, I'm kind of assuming that because uh, the reason I am prepared to do that in that detail is I've been translating the book of Galatians. And it's probably clearer in the book of Galatians than it is even in the book of Romans. But uh, it's very clear. Jesse. This, this, this kind of historical perspective puts a whole different light on words like the fields are white unto harvest. Uh huh. Or uh, why Paul, when he defended himself, did it in the way he did by coding history. Mm -hmm. Why Stephen did it too, mm -hmm. you know? That, that puts the reason or a, a perspective of why was it done that way or what were they trying to do? Why did they do it this way? Yeah, and it also is very clear in the book of Hebrews. Uh, and it's not supersessionism. Uh, that means that Christianity is the successor to Judaism because the law is still an expression of God's will for human beings. We are no longer under it, but Paul fights hard that the law was not evil. Now that's important because our attitude toward the, the old law has been corrupted, let's say, by Lutheran ideas, by Luther's uh, intense distinction between law and grace. Uh, Paul did not see that law and grace were opposite. He saw that one led to the other. Uh, We've, we've seen that. the same problem when we start separating Old and New Testament. Yes. Uh, we, but, we perpetuate that idea. Uh, because, yes, because I'm going to say this for the thousandth time probably. Every time the word scripture is used in the New Testament, with one possible exception in First Peter, it means, you know, Second Peter, it means the, what we call the Old Testament. Uh, all of the promises about Scripture and quoting it, they, it's an Old Testament. Actually, in 99% or more of the cases, it's not just the Old Testament, it is the Septuagint Greek translation of the Old Testament they're talking about. I have two questions. I don't know if you want to go into them now, but I should ask you after class. My understanding from Galatians, I was just studying this in a Bible study, is that the seed is just singular in reference in Galatians 3 referring to Christ. But you're saying that it can also have a pluralistic meaning? No. It is of a single family of which Christ is the head. Oh, okay. Well, that's yeah. helpful. See, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, in the past, scholars would kind of make fun of Paul because uh, he makes an argument that it's, it does not say seeds, it says seed. And uh, that distinction is not in the Hebrew. Uh, but if you take it as family, which you can find, if you, if you get a Hebrew concordance, you will find that it is just as often meant family as it did uh, seed as a particular uh, person. And so I think that the argument made 
by N.T. Wright and others, that that's the way it ought to be translated. And I translate it that way. That there's only one family. See, and that's what Paul insists on. There's only, there used to be two families of God. That's Jews and Gentiles treated differently. But now there is just one family with one head. Remember, uh, Paul says, what is it, Ephesians, where there is just one head of the church, Christ. And it, it all fits together. That's the beautiful idea of, of, of seeing it this way because it's consistent. It, it doesn't leave any loose ends in our understanding. And it's the great argument for Jews and Gentiles approaching God through Jesus Christ on an equal basis. In fact, in Galatians, it's not only uh, Jews and Gentiles, it's male and female, bond and free. There is no difference in the way we come to God through Jesus Christ. It's by faith in Him. Okay. Can I ask you the second part of my question? And that goes to uh, the preceding verses where it talks about in verse 13 of Galatians 3. I know this is not what we're studying. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Is this the only place where Christ violated the law? No, it, he didn't violate the law. That's not what it says. Okay. <laughs> he said he became accursed uh, by hanging on a tree. And that goes back to the great, uh, you remember when Joshua divided the children of Israel into two groups, one on Mount Gerizim and what's, I can't even remember the, what? Mount Ebal. Ebal. Uh, and they talked about the blessings that come from keeping the law and the curses that come. And to be cursed means bad things will happen to you. Uh, that, and uh, I know that's not really what we think of as curse, but that's what it really means. Uh, it's the Hebrew word oi. Uh, and you know. <laughs> that means woe is me, literally in Hebrew. And so Christ became one of those that bad things happen to. That's as close as... as not blessed person? No. Bad things happen to. <laughs> Don't... I'm, I'm trying to be as specific as I possibly can be. Uh, it means God puts punishment on them. Yeah, the verse that says, he who, know, he who knew no sin became sin for us. So, I mean, he, he didn't sin, he became sin for us. Yeah, it's the same idea. Right. Yes, that's, that's the constellation of ideas. And so, remember joy to the world? Mm -hmm. The promise went to wherever the curse is found, that is a profoundly biblical theological Christmas carol because that is the teaching. As wherever the curse, and remember the curse that was put on Adam, not that you will have to earn your living, but that it has made harder because thorns and thistles. Imagine planting a garden or a crop in which no weeds would ever come up. <laughs> uh, I wish nut grass fell under that. <laughs> By the way, it's not a grass. 
I have it on the, on the authority of the garden editor of the Express News. It's actually Nut Sedge, S-E-D-G-E. And it's got interconnecting roots. And if you don't get all of them, you ain't got none of them. <laughs> uh, but we can get far afield. This, we're not studying Galatians today. <laughs> Let's get back to where we were. We are studying Paul. What? We are studying the writings of Paul. <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's right. And they are, they are all interconnected. 